Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Dare Dallas Valuations webinar. It's been a little bit of a while since we've seen you, but it's really nice to be back. Now, today I'm talking to my very esteemed colleague, Jonathan Horwich. And one of the subjects that we've discussed uh, together quite a lot over the last few weeks has obviously been the sale of the Botticelli that came up for sale at Sotheby's in New York a few weeks ago. Now, one of the first questions I had to ask him, obviously, was that sale at 80 million dollars. Do we think it was a good buy? Do we think it was an accurate price? And here's how Jonathan responded. No, no, it, it, exactly. And th there were two active bidders. The underbidder was Alex Bell, who's co-chairman of Sotheby's. He was over in New York for the sale. I guess he'd have to go and isolate and just be there for the whole time. And the eventual buyer was uh, a, a, one of the Sotheby's representatives, a Russian speaker, who it seems clear bought something for uh, her Russian client. Now, I the think they bought some other bits as well, didn't they? As yes, well as they did. The they, yeah. they bought some other bits and bits. They certainly were shopping. But mm. the interesting thing is that I would say that it's highly unlikely that the buyer saw the picture. Now, that's a new it's almost, it's almost selling by picture, well, yeah. by image and reputation, isn't it, really? I think that's the newest and most significant development of. of of COVID and recent times is the number of things which have been bought without really anybody actually seeing them. And that's that's always been my mantra and probably other people, maybe even you, that you, you really don't want to buy stuff without seeing it. But now we've sort of left that behind because it isn't an option. So um, the restorers, picture restorers are very busy doing condition reports. They have a, a concession, if you like, they can practice within the auction houses. So a major buyer would get a, a restorer to do a condition report, which is then sent to them. So over and above any report, the auction house or gallery might give them. So they have a, a uh, an independent view of condition and everything else. So people are finding ways to buy things in this period. What's the issue, let's say, if, if somebody decided to buy something without viewing it um, and they got it and it turned out it wasn't quite what they wanted? I mean, obviously, as you and I both know, when when you're selling on the rostrum, it's it's caveat emptor. If you if you buy it, you buy it. Um, but I think that there seems to be a little bit more of a, a general kind of agreement now that that isn't the case. Yeah, well, there is now legislation in place. That it's called generally distance selling. So that there is the possibility that it's quite complicated, but I think it boils down into in the UK. It doesn't apply in the US or anywhere else that I know of but certainly here and maybe within the EU, that if a professional, an art professional, a dealer is offering something for sale at, at an auction that is bought by a private individual, uh, he or she has, I think, 14 days to return it uh, without any questions or, or any, anything else. It simply can be returned. If the reverse is true, in other words, an item that is privately owned is offered and a dealer buys it, that professional has the normal rights, so it's caveat emptor. It seems to be creating a sort of slightly more level playing field for private collectors, which is probably a good thing. Hmm. It just gives them the opportunity to make sure things are, and, and, and especially, yeah. I, 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 I doubt anyone has uh, incorrectly attributed the Botticelli, no. but you know, it's, um, it's one of those things whereby it's nice to have that reassurance. And do you think yeah. that's meant people have actually had the you know, the gusto to, to bid more because they're thinking, yeah. okay, well, if it's not right, at least I can go and get it checked out by my guys. And once they realize, you know, that it's okay, I've, I've got that assurance. Yeah, I think it has helped. It, it, it's included um, many more people than I think it would have before. And, and I think the, the, the way auctions have gone is, is a, you know, possibly a numbers game that, that as each sale goes by, there probably are more, more participants you know, if you're not a, a native English speaker, most auctions majority are probably conducted in English. If you are look at it across the board, but if you're a non-English speaker, then bidding online just with a screen in front of you is is a is a, a really easy way to do it and a possible way. And I don't think it's just the. I mean, we're, we're talking about the the multi multi million in pound international market here, but I think auctioneers in in the uk as a whole have done incredibly well at actually managing to put on good regional sales 
whilst uh, still in the middle of lockdown. I mean, the vast majority of, uh, of auctioneers of, of regional sales that I know have, uh, have carried on. And it's almost been a case that, you know, that they've been uh, selling to a, an empty room with three screens in front of them. But they've managed to do it, which I think is remarkable. Yeah, I think it is remarkable. They've turned around. It shows you, know, you think of auction as a process. It is, you know, on a par with the oldest profession in the world, isn't it, really? That auctions, <laughs> as, as we see them, have been like they are for two or three thousand years. That if you or I were slaves in Egypt, then we would have been put up on a, on a podium and someone would have bid for us, or not, as the case may be. And, and that really hasn't changed. So y- you might argue that, that change was due and somehow, like so many things in life, it's been forced, but they've reacted incredibly well. And you, if you are a, I don't know, a regional sale room or indeed any sale room, it may be that what you do, you can do more efficiently if there aren't lots of random people milling in and out. I mean, it sounds rather weird, but I just wonder whether actually it makes their lives, although different, maybe easier. I hate to say it, Jonathan, but I, I've, <laughs> had this, I, I've had this discussion with a few people and yeah. it's almost been the case of saying, OK, as an auctioneer, do you really need, I mean, with the technology that we've got now and the vast majority now of even regional sale rooms having their own software in terms of bidding software and things like that, that works on a par with Sotheby's Christie's Bonhams. Do we really need to have the man sat behind the rostrum? And, you know, as, as an auctioneer myself and you as an auctioneer, I like to think that a person behind the rostrum, even if I'm selling to a screen, I can get that extra bid, whereas a, a computer screen may not. I don't know. But what's your view? Yeah, on that? yeah I, I think so. And I think, you know, from the security point of view, the staffing point of view, the all of these things, you know, without a, a row of, of little old ladies with, with thermos flasks and bar seats <laughs> on the front row in a country house sale, it wouldn't seem to be the same. Yet it probably would work perfectly well without them because they're probably there for the fun of it, which is still there and it still is fun, but maybe it's just moved on now. It's funny you should say about the country house sales, because I think in the past you know, month or so, we've had two fantastic country house sales. One obviously drew it and the other one Golding Young. And both of them done with fantastic catalogues and really well done with um, Matterport videos of going around the property showing each item. And then again, sold from, from an empty room. But some of these figures that have been coming from these big country house sales are astronomical. And I, I personally was looking through it and watched both of the sales and was thinking, really, this is remarkable. Do you think that people are, are looking to spend money on antiques at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think that with interest rates at 0.1%, uh, money that you would otherwise put in a bank, well, you're probably not going to do that. So people are looking not necessarily for a safe haven, but they're thinking, you know, I could buy something interesting with this money. It may or may not be worth more in the future. Let's hope it is. But I like it and I'll get value out of it by owning it. So I don't think they're consciously investing, but they're perhaps looking at these things. I think for, for many, many years, what you and I as as people within the auction world took for granted in other words it's all there you can buy it it has been a mystery to a lot of people mm. they they read about things but they don't think for one minute you know i talk to people about ls lowry and and often halfway through the conversation they will say oh so you can buy original paintings by lowry at auction they're not <laughs> all in a mu- museum and i think that is you know it, it dispels a lot of myths that there is stuff out there which you can buy and, you know, the, the active bidding is something that you can get used to. It's something that people do on video games or in other areas, such as eBay and elsewhere. So they're familiar with the, the winning the, the piece. I mean, that's perhaps the, the, the way people talk about it has changed. You now win a lot rather than buy it, which yes. is new to me. But then I, I always thought, win a lot you know, you're not really winning, but. But, uh... <laughs> it is definitely dog food, yeah. but you're winning a, you you win the auction it's something like that so, so it, it, there's a new uh, spirit of, of going into an auction with the idea of winning the piece you're you're aiming for rather than simply buying it and that probably increases competition and levels of interest no, it's, it's an interesting thing. As you say, I, I think the younger generation of people who are 
perfectly adept at now using Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams to have, you know, conversation with their friends uh, are, are perfectly happy to leave bids online for these items, whereas potentially they may not have gone to a sale room in the past just because it's, uh, you know, it, it yeah. could be. I mean, there, there is still, I think, to a lot of people that that age old myth of you go into a sale room, you scratch your nose and you end up spending 20 million pound on a vase. And um, I think that's, you know, <laughs> Slight, slightly different these days, you know, with thanks to all the TV shows and whatnot. But um, it's yeah, it's I, I think I think it's going to, to carry on like this. Now, in terms of the volumes and the stock that auction houses have had, surely that there, there must have been some issues with that. Yeah, I, I think that the across the board for the main houses, Bonhams, Phillips, Christie, Sotheby's, that they're, they're around about 20 percent off where they were in um, in the 20, so looking at 2020 numbers, then the, the volume of auction sales was down about 20%, um, but they compared favorably with the previous years, 2018 and 2019. So they're down, but not out, if you like, uh, and they've leveled up in some cases by increasing private sales. So in other words, uh, approaching people directly with things and indeed probably accommodates people who are nervous about selling in a market that at the time going back to the summer or spring looked like you know would it be successful or not but now with almost a year since since the first lockdown it's clear that not only is the auction market alive and well it's arguably for iconic pieces and certain items actually stronger because the reach is so much wider it does appear to be more buoyant in though it's specifically in those areas but <coughs> it, it, it's strange with, with with something that obviously has been derided for many years the brown furniture market and even in the last year things that a couple of years ago that just wouldn't have been any interest you know the, the inlaid walnut loo table and whatnot and things like that um are, are making more money than ever at the moment well not than ever but you know then then the last 10 years yeah. certainly and people are clearly wanting to buy these things, which is a good indicator of, of, of the just the overall success of the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, it could be tied up with all sorts, sorts of things, couldn't it? Simply recycling, a, a green attitude towards if your house is full of furniture that is, you know, um, old but, but has value and is interesting, you could really reasonably qualify that as green. It, it's not being produced and it's it's something which you can use and and when you're finished with it you can give it this pass it on to someone else that could be that element of it with brown furniture i don't know whether there's a fashion change but people may feel that it is overlooked it's probably in some cases 50 percent cheaper than buying new maybe even less uh and if you buy the right piece it looks great and there's lots what? you know people like the the repair shop, all of these programs on TV, which now people are at home almost forced to watch them. That's probably <laughs> expanded people's awareness of, of what's out there. What do you think we're going to see over the next, let's say, six months? Because we, we don't really know what's going to happen um, in terms of lockdown. Everything at the time of this, this video being done, uh, obviously things were going relatively well in the UK with the vaccine program. Um, things were looking a little bit more promising. Um, do you think in the next six months we're going to see any major changes? Do you think we're going to see a downturn in the amount of people that are, are trying to bid on auction or bidding for big items? Do you think that auction houses might even wait a few months to see, you know what, should we, should we hang on until we're out of this? Yeah, well, maybe what's, what's the, the comparison? The, the, the new Bond movie has, has moved, the release date of that has, has kept moving because that's a single product which has a huge investment behind it and they want to release whatever the movie is called at the right times. So it was going to be November, now it's going to be some other time. I think with... Auction, I think it was nicknamed, I think it was nicknamed No Time to Release. No Time uh, to Release. <laughs> but I, I think that for the moment, I don't predict any particular change in the way um, auctions operate. If anything, I would say that they will expand the number of on timed online sales. Those are sales, for those of you unfamiliar, they're sales that take place over a two or three week period. And we rather like eBay, you can watch the, the bids tick up and tick down and you have a last minute bid and so on. There'll be more of those because clearly it saves space, time and staff time as well. So they may focus on 
higher valued items. The big beasts of, of the auction world were always contemporary, impressionist and modern and old masters. Old masters we've seen is doing well. Contemporary and impressionist and modern departments have literally blended together. They, they've basically homogenized into one. And so people that used to email me from modern and British, modern British art, for instance, they're now all part of contemporary and post-war. So that I think will create a, a greater mass of, of brains for a start and financial muscle. So things that perhaps were slightly on, on the edge will be pulled into the, um, the center. So everyone will be more involved in, in everything, which although it takes a while to get used to, will only be a good thing. So I, I think they will be looking now to expand what has worked and what hasn't. So more time sales, more sales where you think you'll get to see contemporary art and you do, but also there's some random things thrown in. I was just about to say, because we had a chat about this not so long ago, and I've got a little photo here of, um, let's just see if we can find it. There we go. Now, tell us about this, Jonathan. Yeah, so imagine you're, you're it, 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 we're going, rewinding a year or so and you're going to a contemporary art sale in New York and you're, you're expecting to see Andy Warhol and uh, all of the, the greats of 20th century art and what's in the middle of it all, this T-Rex, almost inexplicably, we all remember reading about the Leonardo that was sold at Christie's in the, within the contemporary sale. This is a, just one stage further, this uh, complete skeleton was offered uh, last year in October and made $31 million, which in itself is extraordinary. Um, um, but even more so is its company. Literally everything else except for this was contemporary art. Do you think, Jonathan, and it, it, was, it was a similar question I think I, I probably asked you around the, um, the Leonardo kind of point, was... Do you think this is they're looking at a sale and thinking, what are people going to buy and the type of buyer and the change in which people are buying things? So, for example, somebody that used to buy a Leonardo would probably be in the market for a Botticelli. However, that Leonardo was so iconic that it, it was put in a contemporary sale. Do you think the same thing? with this Tyrannosaurus Rex and somebody thought, you know what, the, the type of person that is likely to spend X, Y, Z on a good piece of modern art will consider this to be a, an equally good piece of modern art and, and put their hand in their pocket for that. I think so, although I think there's also an element of, of um, you know, what, 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 can, what can people bid? If there's a financial element to it, yes. They, they might be trying to sort of, you know, like an algorithm, second guess that, that someone who bought a, a, a Warhol might buy a T-Rex. I don't think that works in quite the same way. But if, if you like the contemporary auction, the highlight of the season is where all of the big hitters will be. So if you want to aim your, your big piece at some big hitters, even if it's not what they're expecting, then slot it in with the rest of this. They've, some of us have also put Ferraris um, hmm. uh, star Ferraris into contemporary sales. So it's like, a, I don't know, like a department store where you, you go in and you're looking for a new suit, but in the middle of it is, is a display of watches. You weren't looking for a watch, but actually there are some and you've got the money. How about that? I think it's just selective placing of something that just might catch someone's attention. No, I think you're right, actually. And I think for, for anyone um, that may have read my article on the, uh, the triptych of Alfa Romeos that were in um, the Sotheby's uh, contemporary sale as well, which were astonishingly beautiful. And uh, yes, I, I think I, I've seen one or two of them in the flesh before, um, yeah. but certainly not all together and certainly not sold together. So it, that, was, that, was, that was incredible. But another thing that happened this week in, in one of the regionals, Jonathan, which was, um, which, which was uh, if anyone reads the ATG, they will have seen it on the front cover this week, which uh, was quite remarkable. I'll bring up the image of it now. Now, this was estimated, I think, what, a, was it 40 to 60 quid or something like that, Jonathan? It, it was estimated at 400 to 600 pounds. Yep. So, uh, and, uh, and, yeah, you carry on. No, I was about to say, from, from what I know about it, certainly from what I've read, 
Um, a hundred people went to kind of try and follow it um, on one of the bidding platforms that the, the regional sale room used. And uh, it ended up going for quite a bit of cash, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, this, this, is, this for me, it's a tiny thing. What we're looking at is, is a beautiful portrait by an artist called Mary Beale, one of the, the perhaps least recognised but most significant uh, 17th century painters, portrait painters. So looking at it, it's about the size of a magazine, more or less, in a beautiful Florentine frame, which you can't see. And perhaps understandably, it came up in a sale, sale room in Colchester, not necessarily something that they would immediately recognise, but there was a buzz about it. So there are two things. There's a buzz about this. It was in at four to 600,000. The bidding systems that they had were able to accommodate 100 people who'd registered to bid on it. Now, you go back perhaps even two or three years, and, and that would probably crash the system. So you've got 100 people all bidding on it. So it goes from four to 600 to, you probably guessed already, 100,000 pounds. And it, it was the highest price that that particular sale room had, had ever had for anything in the history of the world ever. So they're delighted. The thing is beautiful. Uh, it was- uh, is, it, is, it, is it her son? Yeah, it, it, it is Mary Beale's son, who she yeah. painted a number of times. So there are existing portraits that compare to this. This is a very beautiful and relatively untouched, um, an original piece. And there was an interview with Philip Mould, who some of you will have seen on Antiques Roadshow and Fake or Fortune, where he describes it as a, a, you know, a singularly beautiful piece. He didn't buy it. He was one of the 100 bidders. We don't know who did buy it, but it is a very special thing. Um, but I just think it, it illustrates, I think the other thing that it illustrates is that even if I told you the sale room, it wouldn't mean anything necessarily. But the power of, of the internet now means that this, which perhaps would have slipped through unnoticed 20 years ago, now is noticed by certainly more than 100 because there's lots of people who spotted it who decided not to bid. So hundreds of people spotted it. It made what you might argue is, is its right price, maybe even more. Uh, and therefore, this whole idea of, of discoveries, yes, they're much easier, but probably much harder to, to find discoveries these days because everyone is so well served with information online. I think now, it's... Imagine, you know, if, if you wanted to bid, if you wanted to never sleep, then you could spend your entire time bidding on auctions around the world. It's funny you should say that. I, I was speaking to a friend of mine yesterday who was talking about a painting. I, I won't tell you where it was coming up yesterday, but um, it was in a job lot and grouped together with two other paintings. And um, he said, well, I know where it came from. I know the gallery and I know the artist. And he pointed at one that he, you know, kind of uh, metaphorically that he had on the wall and said, well, that, that's the same artist. And I know where that came from. And I know that this is that. Um, but they haven't done the work on the attribution of the monogram on the painting. So therefore, I know it is what it is. But the, yeah. the thing was, though, that was in, a, you know, I think without an estimate. And already it was 450 quid before the auction had even started with 30 people watching it. And you obviously know that it's not just him that's picked up on it. So yeah. as you say, arguably now, the sleeper kind of thing, unless somebody's catalogued it terribly badly or photographed it terribly badly, is, is it a thing of the past? Yeah, I, I think that's, that, that it's, it will be rare to find something that, that remained undiscovered uh, in an auction these days that there's, there's so many ways of finding things, there's so many people looking, and it may go back to your early, earlier comment about uh, there, there being an increased level of buyings in areas like brown furniture, you probably find it elsewhere. Um, auction it, it probably is unlimited in so far as it, where it might be able to reach. And therefore, you know, as a seller or a buyer, it's probably a golden moment, I think. Hmm. Very much so. Well, let's have a look at, you very kindly sent me some images that uh, you, you noted that were, they were of current interest. Let's just have a quick look. Now, you're very well known, Jonathan, for being a particular specialist in Churchill. And uh, you've obviously spoken and written about Churchill extensively. But the, the, the vendor of this one surprised me when you told me about it, Jonathan. And I, I wasn't expecting it, if I'm being totally honest. So what do you know about this piece? And can you tell us who it's by? 
Well, I, I know it's immediately recognisable to me as a piece by Winston Churchill, who, uh, as a respite from the First World War, um, stayed at a farm about a mile from where I live, just outside Godalming, and was advised by a painter friend of his, John Lavery, to take up painting. So he began painting in 1917 and never stopped. Uh, and this, if I asked everyone watching this, who do they think this, um, this belongs to, uh, I, I think you probably would just give up eventually. Uh, this, for me, is a classic auction lot in this new world of auctions. It is by the most famous, first, one of the most famous and recognisable people in the world, Winston Churchill. It was painted during one of the most significant periods of the 20th century, the Second World War in 1943. It's the only picture that Churchill managed to complete during the war because he was obviously busy doing war stuff, but he did complete <laughs> this one. Uh, and it belongs to perhaps one of the most famous people in the world, and that's Angelina Jolie. So yes, this is Angelina's Jol Angelina Jolie's painting by Winston Churchill. Who knew she even owned one? But she did, she bought it in MS Rao in New Orleans. For those of you who've ever been to New Orleans, it's a center for um, seminars. So people go there for you know, a week's seminar or, or companies have meetings there. And because they get a bit bored, there are a number of antique dealers and MS Rao has been there forever. And so people come in and they, they shop while they're in New Orleans for antiques and art. And Angelina bought this from MS Rao, I don't know, that long ago, probably um, less than 10 years ago. We don't know how much for. The estimate is one and a half to two and a half million pounds. Which is, which is fairly toppy. That is a world record estimate. It's not equal to the world record price for a work by Churchill, which was one that sold in 2014 when Mary Soames, Churchill's daughter, died. Her, her collection, which included many pictures by Churchill, were offered at Sotheby's. And the record is held by a beautiful picture of goldfish swimming in his pond at Chartwell, which was estimated at four to 600,000, but it made over two million. So this is a world record estimate, but still below the world record price of two million. He liked painting his goldfish, didn't he, Jonathan? He liked painting goldfish, he liked <laughs> painting his, his garden, but this is Marrakesh, somewhere where he used to go to relax. And this is at a time when all of the world's leaders in 1943 are meet, meeting to discuss the international situation with Germany versus the rest of the world. And so it's a significant moment, uh, Roosevelt, the, the, all of the major um, world leaders, not the allies, if you like, were there. So it has, it's almost, you're piling provenance on top of provenance, importance on top of importance, fame on top of fame. It, it, it is the, the slam dunk of all paintings. You know, it's the most famous picture by him probably, belonging to the most famous woman, belonging to the most famous period. It just keeps on, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving really. It's coming up on the 1st of March at Christie's. Um, it, it's a punchy estimate, there's no doubt about that. But this is typically, I mean, the, the sort of thing that you might find in a contemporary sale. And actually, if you look at the catalog as and when it comes out, it'll probably be surrounded by quite abstract images. So it's, you know, not that far off the T-Rex really. As, as you say, it's one of the world's most historically most famous people in one of the, you know, the most historical yeah. periods of his yeah. life. You can't yeah. really get that much better. You just, that. you just can't beat it. It's, it's a sort of, you know, a, a double, it, it's not even a double whammy, it's a quadruple whammy. You just can't think of anything more significant than that. And it's, you know, it's a beautiful picture. He painted a lot of pictures, many of which you can see in Chartwell if you go as and when we get back to normal. And they're all in in the the most probably the most valuable garden shed in the world. Down at the bottom of the of his garden, there are the vast majority of the paintings. With uh, it's set up as if he'd just gone out for a cup of tea. So the, his chair is there, painting box, the whole thing. It's a wonderful place. How charming! How charming! Now, from a full time politician and part time painter to 
what I suppose you could actually describe as being a, a full-time painter and part-time politician, really, because uh, the next image that you sent us, uh, let me just have a quick look, was this that came up. Yeah. So let, let's talk about Hockney. And obviously this, this was a tremendous hammer, wasn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much to say about this. It, it is a masterpiece. It's, One of his most iconic images, really. Yes, isn't it? yeah. If, if you over and above the splash pictures, those are the ones yeah. where he's in LA and, and people are diving into swimming pools and the beautiful play of light. This is just, you know, like the Winston Churchill, it's just it, really. Uh, and uh, I was at Phillips for a number of years, and although we, we wouldn't talk about things necessarily as important as this in open, it, this is, you know, one of the most important pictures by Hockney that was in private hands and my one of my ex-colleagues had known about it probably for the last 20 years uh, and I think I chose it because I love Hockney he's one of my heroes I think it's a masterpiece but I also chose it because it came up in December last year so you know as far as New York is concerned where it was offered you know right in the middle of, of Covid that it was uh, a sale just as you described earlier Alistair with no public attending with the the auction being conducted from uh, London, but with, uh, uh, so in other words, it, it takes place in London, but is, is the pieces themselves are in New York. I mean, everything was um, orchestrated beautifully and mm. the, the piece made over $40 million, which is not quite a record for Hockley, it's number two, but it's certainly up there. But I but think when, the reason when you why consider. I chose it was, you know, why it, here is a here is a picture which has been owned by the present owner for certainly 20 years, maybe more. Uh, and I think this is something which gives us all confidence moving forward that with something as iconic as this doing so well at a, such a strange time, the, the auction world is able to well able to to cope with it, not only cope with it, but do fantastically well which I hope makes sense. No, oh, no, totally. And I, and I think, to be honest, I, I think I know we, we work around the auction industry and I think it is admirable how much effort um, the, all the auction has is from, from right down at the bottom to right up at the top of put in in order to make it viable, in order, in order to get these sales in for their clients. And it's a, it's a strange one when you look at kind of clients maybe questioning if it's a good time to sell when clearly results like this prove that they are. We, we had a question in, um, just give me two seconds there. Sure. We, we had a question that basically raised the point of the, um, the previous painting there by Mary Beale. Do we think that it should have been withdrawn and re-entered with correct attribution? I'm not sure whether it would have actually helped it or not, or do you think it may have done? Uh, I think it would not have done. The, you know, for, for, for me with, God, I mean, embarrassingly long years of experience, there is something in, in the mindset of, of those of us, and I include myself, that of discovery, that, that there is a moment that passes uh, and you, you could have withdrawn it and, uh, and re-offered it. That would have probably not taken that long because it's clearly who it was meant to be by. You re-offer it at you know 40 to 60,000. Uh, but are you limiting yourself then? Because ultimately yeah. going, in, going in and making it appear like you know it's fresh to the market, nobody's seen it before, nobody really knew what it was at the auction house. Obviously, you're almost it's almost that that and I, I hate to use this term again, but that Indiana Jones moment where you think, I found yeah. it, it's here. And, and you're in it, you know, you know yeah, imagine you're in at a thousand pounds. So in other words, of those 100 people, yes, in the end, only one of them bought it. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Philip uh, Mould didn't buy it. He was one of the underbidders. You would argue, at least I would, that the, the, the most likely person that I could think of to buy it would be Philip, but he was outbid. I was going to say, I think it would be Philip's bag if nobody had discovered what it was. Yeah. And would have, he would obviously have attributed it himself. Um, However, I think it's it, it's one of those things whereby you, you kind of I, I think the buzz wouldn't have been there had no. it have been correctly attributed in the catalogue. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It, it's a tough call because I've seen it both ways. I've certainly in the past 
uh, when I was much younger, had pictures in a sale I was in charge of, which maybe were, as, as we call it, under catalogued, which, you know, is, is a sort of, it's, I don't quite know what you'd call under catalogued. It's a euphemism. School of. <laughs> in the um, style of <laughs> and, and then under pressure you say okay well I'll pull it out of this sale we'll re-offer it in another sale properly catalogued and nearly all of, of the, those times yes it did go on to sell but I just was conscious that maybe it would have made more if we hadn't have done that the moment has gone in a way and of, of the 100 people how many are you sure will make it to the next auction when it's fully catalogued and it isn't a discovery and it's not as exciting and you've seen it before that time and time again, when you show people things, and maybe we're the same with other elements of our lives, property or other things we buy, we say, oh, I've seen that before, which is, I think, again, a euphemism for I'm not interested or I'm less interested. And that's what would have happened with the Mary Beale. I think, oh, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, what happened to it? Oh, it was withdrawn and re-offered. Oh, OK, I'm not, I, that's not for me then. I think it just takes the, the buzz right out of it. No, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you on, on that point, certainly. And, and as you say, I think judging... But the, questioner, the questioner is right. You know, there's a chance that, you know, that, that it might have made 400 quid. Yeah. It didn't. So that there's always that. It, it's a gamble. But I think in my experience, a gamble worth taking. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and a great and a great tale. And one of the one of the great tales, I suppose, during this lockdown period that we'll probably look back on and go, gosh, can you believe that actually happened during a international lockdown? But uh, alas, it's gone well. Jonathan, we're, we're running out of time today, I'm afraid, but it's always always an absolute pleasure to talk with you and obviously uh, discussing some some interesting things. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again very much for joining us now. Please do, if you, your first time watching us, please do watch some of our other videos on YouTube. You can see me chatting to Jonathan on many different subjects at many different points during last year. And I think uh, we all had many different lengths of hair and facial hair as well. Um, and uh, obviously connect with us on LinkedIn um, and we'll be more than happy to, to share some articles with you and your clients. Um, alternatively, drop us an email if there's anything that you'd like us to cover in one of our articles or alternatively on one of our videos. Now, next week, we're actually going to be joined by one of our new members of the team uh, called Annabelle Parry. Uh, she's one of our new jewellery experts. And we're going to be talking about a few things that she's actually discovered um, and introducing her to you. And uh, we will see you then. So thank you ever so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure as always. Take care. And we'll see you very soon. Bye bye now.